Welcome to Invisible Walls, episode 64. Why is that number so magical to us gamers? It's my favorite amount of bits. 1632, <laughs> 64, 128, those are the big milestones. Well, this is a milestone for us in that we are doing our first ever Q&A only episode of Invisible Walls. It is the July 4th weekend, we are not at work, so we're recording two episodes at once. And we haven't got to enough of your questions in the last month or so, so we are piling them all in to episode 64. Should be fun. Sitting in today to answer your questions is Marcus Beer. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? No. Patrick Morales. Our founding fathers fought for this uh, opportunity to answer your questions. And the opportunity to get (laughs) face drunk and watch fireworks. Stop putting my tea in the harbor, bitches. (laughs) And Ryan Stevens sitting in today as well. Yeah, I'm just worried they still have a bit of King of George III's brain. One day I'm going to look in the horizon and I'll see red coats coming. <laughs> it's a real fear. Well, happy 4th of July and God bless America. All right, our first question is about games that fly under the radar. Marcus, you want to tackle this one? Um, No, I think Patrick should tackle this one. What? (laughs) (laughs) All right, then, Patrick, you tackle it. All right, well, uh, I think this will be a collaborative effort with Brian since he's doing the team effort right now, but the more he tells me about Demon's Souls, the more I want to play it. I think you forgot to read the question. Yeah, (laughs) that's We're not talking about Demon's Souls. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, to preface this little uh, outburst I just had, uh, Dakikus is asking us, you guys mentioned it a little about uh, games flying under the radar with Prototype, but I was wondering if there were any games you saw at E3 that wasn't talked about that you feel is a great game and will surprise audiences. Well... The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, only, we only talked about the great games. Well, yeah. E3 is so overexposed at this point. I mean, we cover everything. So, I mean, for something to fly completely under the radar, I don't even know if it's possible at this point. And Patrick, you already talked about Demon Souls. What's the big deal about that game? Because honestly, I played it at a Tokyo Game Show last year, and I was not impressed. I mean, it does seem underwhelming just at the outset, but hearing more and more about it, you know, through osmosis from Ryan playing. Yeah, I've been um, it, a couple hours into that game. It, it, it's a game that grows on you, surprisingly, um, and it's a lot more interesting with the online elements incorporated with it. Uh, the basic premise for anyone that doesn't know is that it's basically an, a Western RPG created in Japan, which yeah. is kind of a weird dynamic, but they went really all out with this, and it's, it's really interesting, I have to admit. I played a level, and um, it, it reminds me of Fantasy Star Online, Monster Hunter, kind of with Oblivion elements thrown in there, too. And it, just how they incorporate, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it a my it, cup of tea? It's an yeah. it's an acquired taste. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. it's kind of like on the dark fantasy side of yeah. things. But it was it's something I always wanted was I love the sword combat in Zelda, like you know parrying right. with your shield and stuff like that. But I always felt it was, I feel like they've upped it with each. You know, I think Wind Waker had a lot more than Ocarina of Time, and I felt like Twilight Princess was. With the movements and stuff and the learning the sword moves from the skeletons, there was a little more sword fighting. But this is real. Like, I never really got into Die by the Sword on the PC. It just yeah. never clicked with me. But I like the idea of, like, a really good sword and shield combat. And it really comes across. Like, um, there's a little bit of micromanaging. Like, you don't have to worry about, like, food or anything. I always hated that But you do have to worry about, like, how much equipment you you have on your body versus how much you're carrying will affect your stamina mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And, you know, you don't want to fight. You know, if you if you do take sword fight two guys at once, it's pretty hard, but it's, it's you know, As that it makes sense. Be, right? Yeah, it <laughs> makes sense. Me- mechanically speaking, it, it's more of an action game, actually, than an RPG, like there, Ryan There's mentioned. a lot of stat balancing. Yeah. But, yeah, no, there it, are really stats. Rewards your, it rewards reflexes. I yeah. mean, it, it actually kind of feels like Fantasy Star Online, but not in such a, a rigid timer for going through animations. Mm-hmm. And if Diablo wasn't just about clicking madly on things, it kind of has that vibe to it. Yeah, and about, definitely not for everyone. I can say yeah, that. Not for everyone. And uh, again, one of the coolest things about it is the online, which it is. Which is also one of the gimp things about it as well. Yeah. So it's a double edged sword. They have this crazy system where you can only play co op under certain scenarios. It makes sense to the game's story. And there's real rewards for doing it other than just playing co op, like real like, re- in game rewards. But it also means you can't just like play with your friends whenever you want unless you want to put a little extra effort into it. 
one cool thing that'll happen once in a while, once in a blue moon, is that uh, as you try to initiate co-op with someone, there's a random chance that you'll be summoned as a boss instead. Oh wow! In someone their, else's game. In, in their campaign. Wow. And and the incentive for that is that if you win, you get a rare item too. So it, it, it introduces a really weird dynamic when you go into someone's game. You're like, oh, shit, uh, I'm gonna fight you now. Okay. Now, so. when I read this question, the first game that came to mind was Grillnauts. Obviously, it's mm-hmm. been sort of the media darling, quote unquote. It wasn't under the radar for me. <laughs> well, yeah. Ryan has been a champion of Scribblenauts here in the offices. I'll give you that badge of honor, Steven. Yeah, and then the game's going to probably be complete <laughs> 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 Dishwasher, anyone? But, I, mean, even, I think even if the gameplay isn't there, I think just being able to write things and keeping yourself entertained. Well, it's just fun to screw around with. I mean, it's just fun writing something and see if the programmers had the foresight to... But it's not just, I mean, there, there's the initial fun of just seeing how things appear, but how they interact is also pretty right. great. You know, like, you draw garlic and a vampire is going to run away from it. You draw a donut and a cop's going to try to go after the donut, you know? So it's cool seeing all the little interactions between the things you summon as well. Would that be your game of, that's sort of flying under the radar that sh- people should check out? Or you... I think if you own a DS and you're sick of just waiting for, like, you know, Nintendo first-party games to come out, I mean, it's definitely worth just looking at. I mean... Drawn to Life had the same kind of gimmick where it's like, wow, these animations and the little swords you do, they work, but then the level design, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't nothing stellar. Right. I mean, I think you probably played a little more Drawn yeah. to Life than I did, Patrick. And then Locke's Quest did not click with me at all. Yeah. The other, what's it, were they called? Fifth? Fifth Cell? Fifth Cell, yeah. It was their other game. Great art style, great work ethic. They kind of remind me of, uh, do you remember Way Forward? They did like Shantai. Mm-hmm. They always have games that are interesting, but not necessarily fabulous, you right. know? I think Shantae was pretty good. No, then that game was, but like, I don't know, I'm looking at like, Boy and His Blob, again, looks, it's a remake, but it looks interesting, but I'm still not convinced yeah. for the Wii. I think if there's one game, this may sound like a crazy pick for me, but I think if I had to pick a game, it would be Bayonetta. Um, some people listening to this may be like, what are you talking about? That game isn't flat under the radar, but he did mention Prototype and, and asked us for other games like Prototype. And I look at this game a lot like Prototype. does pretty well on the site, has a moderate following, but I don't think people who have followed the game are really going to understand or, or appreciate just how good it's going to be. Uh, it still has that campy Japanese thing where some of the cinemas don't make sense. A lot of the dialogue is stupid and doesn't really make sense within our language. But as far as the action is concerned, is it crazy deep? I mean, we put up a video on last Friday that was just basically a collection of combos from the game. That video ran for almost six minutes. Yeah. And it's still not even half of the combos in the game. No, it's so, totally awesome. It really is. When I saw it at pre-E3 and, and got a chance to play it, it was one of the most over-the-top games I've ever played. Um, I mean, they really just throw the kitchen sink at this game as far as scenarios and set-piece moments. The depth of the, of the combat is there. The character is very unique, and you know her hair is basically her armament and her clothing. Um, I think a lot of people are going to be really pleasantly surprised by that game. And not just the people who like Ninja Gaiden or who like Devil May Cry and those kind of games. I think this game could transcend beyond those audiences and do really well. So if I had one game that I think is sort of seeping under the radar, maybe not getting as much recognition as it should, that game for me is Bayonetta. Yeah, it's not about the gameplay with with Bayonetta for you, though, isn't it? It's just you like the whole dominatrix Sarah Palin <laughs> at E3. And I'm just saying that's just an excuse to put her back in there because our Booth Babes coverage offended people a couple of weeks ago. And to those guys, I'd say grow up, eh? All right, now Marcus has a question for us about morality in video games. Yeah, because I'm the most moral person I know. <laughs> I can't think of anyone better to answer <laughs> the most moral question. person I know. Uh, Soxman444, which I'm assuming is a Boston Red Sox fan, uh, says, Do you think that morality systems in games have become a gimmick in an attempt to add depth to a game? Or does this mechanic create a psychological and deep layer of a game? Well, I actually wanted to ask this, answer this question because, uh, you know, we've had the whole prototype versus infamous question, and right. infamous does have a morality system. And I actually like games with a morality system. I think, yes, in some games, they're used primarily as a gimmick, as a way to pad things out. But if executed correctly, you know, they can actually open up a whole, you know, new um, replayability level. I agree. And I'll use infamous as the example. I play through it on the good level. And then I've gone back and I'm playing on the bad level now. And the bad level is so much more random carnage and just, you know, a deliciousness with the evil. And the fact that the powers and, you know, 15 of the missions are totally different. 
that I like. If it's done properly, it can it can add something to the game because you know you then you have to think about your decisions and do you want to go one way? Do you want to go another? Do you want to really mess things up and alternate and see what happens when you you know you go right down the middle? And I think handled perfectly or handled really well, it adds a lot to the game. But yes, there are a lot of gimmicks in there, and it's the same as the other question we answered last week about the everyman. I mean, I think they go hand in hand. But I'm all for morality in video games and you know just having the option of playing as a bastard or playing as a good guy. See, I just wish it wasn't so black and white. I feel like the original pen and paper D&D was pretty cool with having, you know, good, evil, and neutral, but then mm. mi mixing it up with the also kind of like the subsystem of being chaotic like good. chaotic yeah. or lawful. Because you, everyone knows like chaotic evil is like, would be like the best metal band name ever, but it's also <laughs> a really different way to play than being like, uh, you know, lawful evil. It was interesting. Well, you look at and that Neverwinter Lights and... Fable kind of touched it where it had purity and morality, but I could never... I always felt like a fable. Sorry, Fable Two. I always right. thought it was a little well, fable is more example. gimmicky than other Fallout, things. Fallout Three has it in there to a certain degree as well with the choices that you, that you make. And I, I think you know in well, RPGs it's been around it, for a very it, long time, but now it's bleeding through into you know uh, third-person sandbox games, first-person mm -hmm. shooters. I, I was just curious with Patrick. I know you played uh, Rise of the Argonauts, which a little bit. not 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 you the best that game. Not the best I game, but um, I thought it was interesting with its conversation system. It yeah. kind of chose what four archetypes, mm -hmm. and it wasn't really cl as clean cut between like you know good and evil. It was more like yeah. wily versus thoughtful and that kind of stuff. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I'm trying to remember the the PR buzz. It sounded um, it caught. It was interesting though. It caught yeah. my ear. I, I did like the the route they took with that, but uh, the the games in which they have a really good morality systems are when your choices stick for the rest of the right. game. Yeah. Um, Fallout 3 did a really good job with that. They have real consequences, right? Yeah. Exactly. How, I mean, how people react to you further down the line. I'm not just talking, sorry to interrupt, but I'm not oh, just yeah. talking about the whole, you know, yes, your image gets, a, you know, you start looking a, a bit of a badass because your skin goes gray and you have scars all over your face. Well, Fable kind of mm -hmm. ruined it for everyone, right? Because it was the first game that was really marketed, publicized, and pushed as this game where you could choose your own destiny. I think a lot of people bought into that, played Fable, and was like, what the? Fable I got a two. halo around my head. Yeah. I got flies <laughs> flying yeah. around my Fable head. Fable 2 did a better job of it. It, it did a way well, better job of it. Black and white, your creature would get all demented. Yeah, too. but yeah. who played black and white? A Mac, lot of people Mac played owners. black and white. <laughs> 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 a, lot of people, a lot of people were happy that they played it. Well, a lot of Mac owners are happy. So, I mean, I mean, to look at the question, uh, yeah, there's a level of gimmick to it. But, I mean, you know, on the other side of gimmick is the whole innovation and stuff that, that sticks. I mean... Hopefully, you know, Mass Effect 2's whole Vanguard Paragon or whatever it's called thing will, will work out pretty well as well. But the, the strict good and evil stuff, I'm, I'm getting a little sick of. I wish there was more of a, a middle ground to play around in. Well, I think there's a, there are a lot of games there where you, you can zigzag back and, forth, back and forth and and plow down that middle, but they're primarily RPG games. All right, and the last question, sadly, on this special July 4th episode of Invisible Walls. Well, I think, you know, we've put in three, you know, we've got three really good questions. We've got, you know, a nice, tidy little show, and I know you have to run off and start burning English people or something. <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan actually has the last question. I got a question from Keisha Remburn, and he says, with, project <clears throat> with projects like Microsoft's Project Natal, Sony's Motion Control, and Nintendo's Wiimote, do you believe that eventually we will have a generation of gaming that have buttonless controllers, and I say, God, no. I still think the best games will have buttons and little analog sticks. And I completely disagree. Yeah, I, I, as, much as, I hate, I, as much as I hate to say this, I'm with Shane on this you one. You think they'll... Uh, Look, the, just read his question. I, Do you believe that eventually we will have a generation of gaming that will have buttonless controllers? Not this one, next. It could be three gens I think, from now. Well, I think we'll always have controllers. Mm, I don't think so. I, I, no I think that... You know, with the Wii now, there's a there is a generation coming through who are used to the remote controller. You know, the the Wii mode with, with mm -hmm. everything being wireless. And I think that in ten years' time, there's going to be a generation who are used to Natal to a certain degree and the the PlayStation version. And I think the generation after that, with you know, three four gaming generations, which could be on twenty years down the line, tops. Yeah. People will be downloading stuff via you know T three lines into their own home or T six lines or whatever terabytes of storage, they'll be downloading stuff instantly, and they will be playing on big screens with sensors built in, and that is... I still is, think we'll still I have mean, the controller apparatus. It's the natural evolution. Look, it started with one joystick and one button, mm -hmm. then it went to a D-pad with several buttons, mm -hmm. then it went to an analog stick with buttons, then it went to two analog sticks with buttons, 
Then it went to a motion controller with, with a couple buttons. Now we're seeing the tall, which has no controller whatsoever, and Sony's, which incorporates a camera and a motion controller. I still think we'll have controllers, though. I, I, I don't, I, I I think, don't think so. I think the only way we'll have controllers, ever. you know. You say an ever. You think for the end of time, video games will always use controllers? Well, let me let me start like perhaps quantify. Unless that. we like okay for the foreseeable future, until we're like maybe jacking into our heads and it's all done through no. like synapses. I think there'll be controllers. I think we're gonna be old and die. We're gonna get old and we're gonna die someday, and we're gonna be the old fogies talking about the days of analog sticks. I think <laughs> the, the controllers that you you may have, you know, in like three generations time, is that where perhaps the the VR aspect of it. May, keep, may make a comeback where the controllers are. You've got uh, VR gloves, which are just you know pretty much Wiimotes right now, and you've got the VR goggles, and you're immersed that way, and that's the way you use them as a controller. Um, but yeah, I, I can see the an enter controllers you know, in our lifetime. I just see there's, I think there's generation buttons on so many. Next, there's, just a, there's just buttons on so many things. Like when you shoot a gun, there's a trigger. I know Natal has you like you know revving and stuff like that, but I still think you want that tactile feedback. I think we want that tactile feedback, but I think you know there are kids who are you know just like there are kids now who or people who listen to this who've never bought an eight track or never bought an LP, even though vinyl's making its way its way back. They don't know what Betamax is. There's a whole generation of you know born up born and raised on DVDs. There are you know Netflix streaming the videos and we're talking 10, 15, 20 years down the line. Yeah, the stuff that we are thinking is cutting edge now is going to look the same as a Commodore 64 game looks to us now. Absolutely right. I am really split on this because part of me wants to buy into, you know, having Minority Report style gloves and having that, you know, complete freedom of motion. But then there's another part of me, and it's probably my fighting game side talking, that really needs that tactile touch, like Ryan says. It's like the iPhone. Like, some people can't bear to use the touch screen on the iPhone for, in, for typing. It's, it's the same argument for, you know, using a, a game controller. You need, you need to feel what you're pressing. You need to feel. I feel Some like people this, do. Your kids buttons. may not need to feel. Or maybe they're wearing a pressure suit and they're not wearing... A, also, not I think in the controller. future we're going to be even more obese. So, <laughs> swinging like remotes and not if, stuff like not that. Not if we fit has its way. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, just playing, uh, just playing Wii Sports, the first one, I, can, I could get winded with the, the, you know, doing a couple <laughs> rounds of boxing. <laughs> you know? I think to me the real future is what we saw at Sony's press conference, which is that combination of the camera with the controller in his hand, but I think eventually that controller in his hand, that they needed to zap a sword into his hand, or zap like a lightsaber into his hand, I think eventually all it's gonna have to be is a sensor. It's gonna be a little patch that you can stick on the back of your hand to tell the computer where that object needs to go. So I just feel like you know, buttons are to, a really to rain, easy you know, way to interact to rain with on the, mo the Sony motion control, or it'll be like Natal, with, you know, but stronger where it's full body mapping, full, Facial recognition, full voice recognition, and every part of you it maps, you know, maps the entire environment you're, you're in. So you're literally, you could also even be, you know, to, for the Star Trek is out there. It could be a holodeck. I mean, yeah. that's that's how far. I mean, gaming's got no boundaries with regards to that. And I figure, you know, this is what I'll say: is once they've figured out a way to do interactive porn, then then everybody else will follow on. Because let's face it, porn is the industry leader for technology. It generally is, sadly. What do you mean, sadly? I <laughs> love it. <laughs> The multi-angle views on uh, Chicks with Dicks 36? Fantastic. <laughs> but, oh, wow. And I've got your copy. Oh, actually, I need to give you a copy of that back, by the way. It's clean. Don't worry. I think I'm good with that one. But I, I think that we're going to see this technology sooner than you guys think. I think, honestly, generation after next generation, done deal. I, I mean, look at how far Sony came already with their controls. I mean, look at Natal. You don't have to hold any buttons on it, though. On the on Project on Natal? The no, on the wand. On the, no, I'm yeah, saying, but look at that technology already. Yeah, I just still think there will be buttons. Like, I, I'm not saying they'll go completely away, but uh, I think there will be buttons. It's just such an easy fix. I disagree. I don't. I think eventually it'll just be you in whatever world they want to put you in, and then it's totally you. It, I, don't, I think I don't think there'll be such a thing as a control interface. It's just you being you in whatever world the game decides to put you in. And if you're in a v, you know, you're in a VR Except suit. Except World of Warcraft. <laughs> if you're in a VR suit or you've got the gloves or whatever, I mean, you know, we've already got the, um, you know, the, the, the outfits that give you the, the force feedback. You know, that being implemented in a glove. I mean, you can buy the pads for them right now. I mean, nobody supports them. You've got the rumble chairs and all that sort of stuff. You know that technology. It'll get more streamlined. And, you know, maybe in the future it's not consoles as such, maybe they are sold as, they are suits, and Sony or, or Nint uh, Nintendo or Microsoft sell these pads, these gloves and everything, and that's the, all the interface you need, you don't even plug it into your TV. <laughs>
All right, that's going to do it. Episode 64. Hopefully you noticed our little nods throughout the show to the Nintendo 64 and Commodore 64. I uh, just wanted to celebrate those two incredible platforms from our past. I don't think we'll call the N64 incredible. Mario 64 and Ocarina yeah. of Time would like to disagree. Yeah. And GoldenEye. There were some incredible well. games, but as a platform, I don't think it was all that great. I think someone likes Wave Race a lot. I do enjoy Wave Race a lot. And uh, GoldenEye. Yeah, Perfect Dark. There were some good games for it. Jeff Force, Gemini. We can go on. This is back when Rare was making good games. Yeah, back when they basically carried an entire platform on their backs. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I hope you enjoyed the uh, glimpse back at some old games from the past. We definitely appreciate you guys watching and listening. Hope you guys have had an awesome July 4th. I know we're going to celebrate with some sparklers. So thanks for watching. We'll see you guys when the holiday is over. Invisible Walls. Kaboom!